Matt Farah of The Smoking Tire has been one of the most legendary and formative figures in the world of automotive YouTube content. From his one takes to the podcast to partnering with Auto Tempest to produce Sorted, he's made some incredible content that we've enjoyed and it's changed the way we look at the platform over the years. But today we've compiled his top 10 VinWiki car stories. In fact, Matt once had the record for the most stories told in this chair in a single sitting. I think he did 12 in one day. But we love his content and I appreciate I've been tremendously honored for him coming here to share his amazing stories. I also want to thank BetterHelp for sponsoring this video and several this year on the VinWiki channel. BetterHelp is a great way for you to find the right therapist for whatever it is that you're going through in life. We need to spend more time focusing on our mental health and BetterHelp offers therapy in an easy and accessible and very affordable way. They have an app that you can access on your phone or on their website to find the right therapist for you. You go on, answer a few questions, and they partner you with, generally with in 48 hours with a great therapist perfectly tailored to help you with whatever it is that you're going through in life. I know at times I've run into issues with work or relationships that I just didn't think I could get past on my own and it's really helped me to talk to the therapists at BetterHelp to get past it, to understand a different angle into the problem that I'm having and find a perfect resolution. So I've enjoyed it myself. It's helped me a lot and I know that you will too. So check them out now at the link in the description below or type in betterhelp.com slash finwiki to find the right therapist and get past whatever issue there is in your life. It's a great asset and a great way to enjoy your life a lot more. And Matt Farah has certainly enjoyed a lot of amazing things in A Life Well Lived. And so check him out now in his top 10 VinWiki car stories. Go yell at every Jeep Wrangler owner in America. Thank you. It's certainly become a trend, hasn't it? That things are now safaried. And it's funny that a lot of people kind of accuse me of being, of riding that trend. And, and that that's what I'm doing. But the story of my safari, when Lee Keen, who builds these Keen Project Safari cars, I've known him since 2005, when he was racing for Farnbacher Lowell's. Greg Lowell's of Farnbacher Lowell's, they were like a ALMS GT team. He stole like $10 million from a church and went use it to go racing. But Lee was one of his drivers. He was a very, very talented driver. And when he retired from professional racing, he had built this cabin in the woods in North Carolina, and he built a, he took a 911 SC, and he, built his, his own safari car, and it was safari number one. He built it for himself. Um, and it was built after the 911 SCRS models of, I believe it's 85, 84, 85. And the idea being that you have not a, 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 comp a competition rally car, but you have a 911 that feels like a 911 in a lot of the important ways, but that has some overlanding capability as well and some light rallying, hooning kind of capabilities. So the cars are really all the same. When you build a keen car or commission a keen car, the only things you get to choose are, would you like a 3.0 or a 3.2 engine, an SC or a Carrera, and what color? And what kind of interior fabric would you like? And that's pretty much it. The rest of it is a standard package. And so what they do is, so, so to back it up, forget what they do. He invited me to go to North Carolina to drive his keen car on my show, Tuned. This is how far back we're going, bro. So the safari trend is what, two, three years on now? I drove his car in 2014. So that's when I figured out, and, and you can go watch the video, it's still up. Within five minutes behind the wheel of this car, of his car, I, was, I knew this was a thing I had to have. Not only one day, this is my next car because I had a Raptor and I liked, I liked certain things about the Raptor, the, the shocks and, the, and that kind of stuff, but it's, it was enormous, it was stupid. It's, you don't, nobody needs anything that huge in Los Angeles, it's ridiculous. So I wanted something that would tackle the urban environment that I was in the, yes, I'm in the canyons filming, but on my day to day, going to the store, going to work, those roads are terrible. And so air-cooled 911, classic, practical, usable, but also different off the beaten path, and with its focus shifted a bit. It's important when you're building a customized car, commissioning a customized car, or buying a customized car, to be honest about 
what your needs are gonna be for that car. If you're driving around the city all day, you shouldn't buy a GT3 RS. That is not an optimized experience. And if you wanted to buy a, a classic 911 for use in an urban environment, well, a four inch lift is actually kind of practical. It's not so tall that it can't get around a corner. It, it's got some lean, a little bit of trophy truck lean, but that's that's part of the charm. It's you trophy trucking out a 911 a little bit is an incredibly charming experience. The body roll is fun. When it rains a little bit, the loose surface, man, I slide entrance ramps like, I, I, I get I get the back out, I get, I get low, low, uh, low grip uh, surfaces, this thing is killer. And you take it on some dirt, you take it on some sand, and I'm not even kidding, it, it turns in like a GT3 on dirt. You, tr you load up the brakes, you transfer the weight forward, and then just smash it and just slide it out, and it's great. We got a beautiful diff in there. For the last two years, it's pretty much been my daily driver. And there's people who will call me a pussy because I don't go to the trails every weekend or something, but the fact of the matter is, I do a lot of driving, and on my days off, that's not really what I like to do. I'm sorry, I have a lightly off-roaded vehicle that I don't take off-road that often. Sue me. Go, go yell at every Jeep Wrangler owner in America. Thank you. I do go off-road once in a while. It is fun. I have snow tires for it. I take it to Mammoth. It's my ski car. And it's cool. I mean, a guy looking like me pulling up in a lifted pink Porsche with bus interior, that you look at that and you go, what is going on in this dude's head? You know, and, and I, I like creating that type of reaction. When your build is, is cohesive, but then there's something about it that's like, whoa, what's that? You know what I mean? And, and I typically achieve that with very loud interior fabrics, um, which I did, I've done in other cars as well. And I think it's really fun to, to, to play with that. And because a lot of people take these cars very seriously, so I don't. But most importantly, it's just a fun little car to drive. And, and, and for all intents and purposes, it's just my car. <laughs> you know, I don't remember exactly. It was in Santa Cruz and I had Sharkworks inspect it, and I was gonna paint it a different color. It was cheap. It was cheaper than it should have been because Cassis Red, the color, is I think a beautiful color when photographed well. The owner who I bought it from was the worst photographer on earth, and he photographed it at high noon and it looked like garbage, and that's why it was cheap. That and it was probably, three or 4,000 miles from, uh, from needing a top end rebuild as well, which, which I ended up having to do. The G5911, even just to buy, you know, that's a fabulous car to drive. I never said, hang on, let's not do this. I never got to that. It was never like, wait a minute, this is great, just leave it. It was always bought for the purposes of doing that build. When you decide you want one, first off, even then, but certainly now, there's a very long waiting list. I had to wait almost a year. And, and this was years ago. You can either buy your own donor or they can find one for you. And then you send it down there and they rebuild the engine. They do skid plates. Uh, they shave the mirrors and they do those tight rally mirrors. They do, you know, the lift. Elephant Racing made the suspension. They now have a new shock setup that I don't yet have and I probably won't get, but it's, I don't remember who makes it, but they do the skid plates, the bumpers, the fog lights, the body work. Um, their, their body guy, Bryson, is incredible. I think they've built 25 or 30 of the cars. It takes about 10 months once they start and the choosing of the fabrics is really fun and, and there's a lot of whimsy in it. And, and I'm probably the poorest guy who owns one of these things. These are, a lot of these guys have these as like off-road toys and they beat the crap out of them. They just trash them and rebuild them and fix them and they just hammer, hammer, hammer. And the Safari Club is not a bunch of posers. It's a bunch of guys who really do want to use these cars. And I was supposed to go on the Safari Southwest Rally but it was canceled for COVID, unfortunately. We'll do it, do it next year, but it's a really cool car. And I think that sports cars that have good on-road dynamics, that can be translated very easily to good off-road dynamics as well. The, the concepts of weight transfer and all that, that all, it all applies. I don't like to use the word forever, except about the Vanquish, um, but it's certainly not the kind of thing I have any desire to sell. Anytime I've tried to, I use the word forever about my Corvette, I use the word forever about my DeLorean, I use the word forever about my Mustang, and 
none of them lasted. So we're not gonna use that word, but I have no intention of selling it. I want, I really do wanna keep it. A couple people have made offers on it, but they haven't been nearly enough. I mean, it would take a lot of money to get it out of, out of my hands. I really like it. The only person who liked the Hummer was my 90-year-old grandmother. Bad car buying decision number one, Ford Focus RS. The Ford Focus RS, I made a mistake by falling in love with something from afar and allowing my eyes to blur everything else and going, I like, I wanted it because I had the Fiesta ST, which I loved. And I go, okay, well the Focus RS is the next bigger, faster thing. And so I pre-ordered it there were delays, they messed up the ordering system, whatever. By the time they got it, a Galpin Ford, they put it, because they like me there, they put it in their Aston Martin showroom on the turntable. So when I go in, it's like, and it was sparkly blue, so, and I was like, where do I sign? I think maybe a mile or two into my drive home from there, I went, this seat is really uncomfortable, and this car rides like absolute dog shit. Oh God. What have I done? And I didn't buy it, I leased it. I did everything I could to fix the car. I convinced KW to design a set of adaptive shocks for it to fix the ride. I got different wheels that were actually smaller and had more sidewall. I did all kinds of different stuff to try and make the car better. Ultimately, it was so uncomfortable to drive and to even make it the ride and stuff bearable you needed an $8,000 set of adaptive shocks from Germany, you know, to do it. And so it just, I hated it so much. I, I, it, was, I, it was a lesson in, if I'm gonna buy a brand new car, I gotta, I gotta drive it first. I can't, I can't see and then buy. You and no one should ever do that. And people do. People do all the time. See, order, buy, and they don't sit in it or anything first. And so you can get away with that sometimes and it works out. But in this case, especially because I leased it, I got hosed bad. Over 18 months, it cost me $16,000 to drive a Ford Focus that I hated. And that's how I end up now with a Ferrari 328. Because I go, I spent 16K to drive a Focus. Am I gonna drive 16K of value out of this car in two years? There's no way that that will happen. And so no more leases. If I hate it, I can sell it. I'll take a loss, but it's gone. And no more buying new cars sight unseen. Another bad one, impulsive trades. Impulsive trades, the worst. And so this one, <laughs> this is a good start. I was working at Gotham Dream Cars for Rob Ferretti. And I was living in Manhattan and commuting to New Jersey. I had a B6, a 2005 Audi S4, which is a lovely car in silver put a Labrie exhaust on it. They're out of business, but Labrie really made the best exhaust on that car. And one day I'm commuting to New Jersey for work. It's a horrific rainstorm. It's a, it's a, there's flooding everywhere. The highways are like, it's a disaster. It's taken me two hours to go 15 miles kind of thing. And I'm driving stick and just hating everything, right? And I'm stopped on like a cloverleaf exit ramp. I'm stopped there, single lane, just nothing moving. And I'm looking at this grassy knoll here, and I go, if I had a Hummer, if I had a Hummer, I would be out of here right now. And I already was kind of on a thing because I was going to work at Gotham Dream Cars, and I wanted a really cool car, and the S4, don't get me wrong, it's a lovely car. It's a very, very nice car. But I wanted something that was a little more flashy. You know, I'm, I'm in the exotic car world. I wanted to be I, want, I didn't just want to work there, I wanted to live it, live the lifestyle. Remembering what I had said in the traffic jam, that very day, a guy named Steve Waldy, and he's a Lamborghini guy, he's a Hummer guy, and he's a whatever wholesaler out of Jersey. He shows up with a Hummer. And it's a 2001 black over tan wagon. And he goes, hey, look at this thing. It's for sale. And I go, hey, let me have a go in that. So I took it out. 
and took a 15 minute drive in this thing. And I went, well, this isn't as bad as I thought it would be. And on the spot, I traded him straight up for my Audi. H1 Hummer, the value of each car was, was around $40,000. So, so he, it was a straight up trade. And I, at the time, wanted to be somebody I wasn't. I wanted to be Hummer guy. I, I, you know, I wanted to be in your face. I wanted to be kind of aggressive. I wanted, I thought I could be, but I, I wasn't that guy at all. The first week with the Hummer was so fun. <laughs> so fun. It kept raining that week and it was deep puddles, four feet of water. I mean, really so fun. And then the next week, someone spit at me. <laughs> the next week, you know, someone left a bag of dog shit on my hood. Now I was living in Manhattan with a Hummer. The only parking garage on the Lower East Side that even would allow me to park there charged me $1,100 a month to park it, okay? It had a 42 gallon diesel tank, but I was working in New Jersey where diesel was like a penny. So I'd fill it up in Jersey, never fine. Then I left that job about a month later and I started commuting to Westchester, which was twice as long and the gas was twice as expensive. And now, I, this, this was my, just my car. This wasn't like a side fun car. This was my car. And I went, and now it's basically like I'm commuting to work in a school bus. You have to actually calculate longer drive times to get places because it's so slow. Because of the portal axles, you know, it does that rocky thing. When you stop, it does this rock. It's very disconcerting. The seats are like Spirit Airlines coach seats. And everyone thinks you're an asshole, basically. <laughs> Pretty much. Which, if you want to be that defiant person, that's a good way to do it. But ultimately, that's not what I wanted to be. I would let like anybody drive it. I hated driving it so much. I had a friend who loved driving it and he really was that defiant asshole. And so he became my driver. <laughs> so he was like, let me drive the Hummer. I'll drive you around wherever you want. He was like 22. So he would drive me to the clubs in New York City, sit out front in the truck. I mean, it was the stupidest thing. After about three months with the Hummer, I just couldn't take it. I was so miserable with this thing. I hated it so much. I drove it to Mini of Elmsford and I traded it straight up for a John Cooper Works Mini. And on the way home from the dealer, I got a ticket doing 97 and a 50. <laughs> the only person who liked the Hummer was my 90 year old grandmother who thought it was the coolest thing in the world. And everybody else in my family hated it. And like my parents wouldn't let me park it in their driveway. It was like, I don't, I don't like park it. With <laughs> the DeLorean was the car that made me love cars. When I was a kid, little, and my dad brought me my very first car magazine. There was a DeLorean on the cover and it, it, it changed my perspective as a kid, what a car could be. And that always stuck. And so when I got a little bit of money, it was, I, I want a DeLorean. And so I found one and I had the guys at DMC do the full deal. It was very, very low miles. This, that car was interesting. It was a 2,700 mile car that had been stuck in a storage unit in San Pedro since 1986. The guy bought it. It was a, it was a built in 82, revinned in 83 as an 83. First sold in February of 85. <laughs> it had made three trips to the dealer in the first year. The company went under, the guy was upside down on his loan and he stashed the car and defaulted on the loan. So when we found the car, there was no papers, none. And the bank that held the note was out of business. <laughs> so I had to get, uh, I learned about title bonds. That was the first time I learned about title bonds. Here's a teaching moment. <laughs> if you have a car with no title, you get a title bond and then it's your car, you register it. But if someone shows up and says, hey, that's not his car, that's my car, they pay that person off. That's how that works. So I got a title bond and I was able to get it registered. The, the, the thing about DeLoreans were, one, that car was, after it was fixed up, it was so nice that actually it was a little too nice to use. And also DeLoreans are very good 
at kind of a medium speed cruise. In LA, you've got light to light traffic and you've got bonsai canyoning and you have almost nothing in between. And it's terrible at both of those things. There's almost nothing you can do to improve it. You can be, people change engines and stuff, but it's not the engine. The problem is the chassis. It's a Y-frame chassis that if you put more than like 250 pounds of torque through it, it'll twist like a pretzel. And it has 14 inch wheels with tiny, tiny little brakes. And so you can't put a big brake kit on it without putting big wheels, which makes it look heinous. So you pretty much have to like a DeLorean for what it is and be able to overlook what it is not, and then just leave it alone. Um, so that wasn't a bad car buying decision, not least of which because I turned, I believe, a $13,000 profit on that DeLorean over three years. So uh, I sold it on Bring a Trailer and, and did really well. So I don't regret that one, but it was definitely a lesson in buying cars that you not just wanted when you were a kid, that you wanna actually use now. Yeah, if Westside, was finished when I needed it to be finished, I probably would have kept that car and looked at it in the garage and driven it once a month and, and it would have been all right. But because it took me five years to build my place, I did not have the luxury of keeping cars around that I wasn't gonna use. Ralph gave his vanquish, his personal vanquish to my father. One of the more interesting cars I've had, and certainly a car that I've had for a long time, is uh, my 2003 Aston Martin Vanquish. Growing up as a child of the 80s, it was always, uh, were you Team Testarossa or Team Countach? And I was always Team Countach. The Aston Martin Vanquish is a very interesting car. So the story of this car is my father um, worked for Ralph Lauren as the president and chief, chief operating officer for 15 years from 2000 to 2015. And my dad was a big Bond fan. And so around 2005, Ralph gave his vanquish, his personal vanquish to my father as a gift. I don't remember the, what the exact milestone was. It wasn't like his birthday or anything, but he, he gave my dad the car. And it's an 03 vanquish. It has, it's, uh, it's tight, dark titanium, the James Bond color, the, the standard, you know, dark gray. But it's unique because it has a purple label interior. Not purple, the color. Uh, Ralph Lauren purple label leather and suede. They sent the swatches to Aston Martin and they do the, the interior with, the, with that. They, uh, Aston Martin, if you're Ralph Lauren, they'll do that for you. They also have, his name is stamped in the door sill, which is very cool, hand built in England for Ralph Lauren's. You know, my dad is not that into cars and he's, uh, he's very tall. He's six, six foot five and he was, he, you know, he worked so much that he would only really drive to the golf course on weekends, but his golf bag wouldn't even fit in the Vanquish. And so I was living locally at the time. I was running the, the, the I graduated from college. I was running the, the detailing shop with, uh, with Larry around that time. And while he didn't give me the car, I basically became its custodian. I drove it once a week or so. I didn't, you know, I was in my 20s. I didn't have to ask permission, I drove it. And to go back to my, my privilege and my growing up and being more honest to, about myself, I used to pretend it was a little more mine than it is. You know what I mean? It was his and I drove it a lot and I cared for it, but I wanted to seem more self-made than I was. And I would tell not entire truths about that car. This, this is the truth about the car. My dad loved it, but he never really showed all that much interest in driving it, you know, besides having it in the garage and taking it out once a month or whatever. In about 2013, uh, when the car had, I don't know, seven, 8,000 miles on it, it did not have a lot of miles on it. We got it with like 3,500 and it did not get driven all that much. But Pops and I decided, that we would send the car back to England to have Newport Pagnell, the, the Aston Martin Works factory, convert it to a stick, which is very expensive. 
and the entire time they're doing it, Aston Martin treats you like they're doing some huge favor for you and you should somehow thank them and not that you've paid them this astronomical amount of money to fix their horrible gearbox. <laughs> but I will say that the car is fabulous. I mean, uh, and while I was there, we, we had them wire open the exhaust baffles, so it's, um, it was on loud mode all the time, which is a beautiful tone. I mean, you know, beautiful sounding car. <laughs> And it's a stick. And it's, um, other than having three pedals in a pedal box uh, sized for two pedals, uh, aside from that, honestly, you wouldn't know it didn't come like that from the factory. I mean, they did a really beautiful job. They, they made the interior look right. The shifter doesn't look out of place. You know, um, everything works. And it's a beautiful car that I really, really love to drive. The only downside is I have to take my shoes off to drive it because the pedal box is so small. And that is annoying. <laughs> but you know, the, the powertrain is great. There's some parts bin stuff, but especially when you compare it to the brand new Astons, my God, is it pretty and elegant and subtle and, and timeless. And I think as far as uh, a long-term hold, in the long-term, Pretty and sounding good is what it takes. The car could be a total hunk of shit. They could have blinkers out of a Volvo and a, you know, headlights from a whatever else. But if it's pretty and it sounds good, it's a good long play. And so I will never sell this car. My dad will technically he still owns it, but but he does, he does it's it's mine. He'll never sell it. I'll never sell it. And you know I feel like Pebble Beach 2040. You know, it, 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 that car will over time become incredibly appreciated and not, not necessarily in a money way, in a, in, a, in a cultural way because of how beautiful it is and because of what it did for Aston Martin at that time and because you can still use it. It's a great, it's a great car to use. It's, there's, there's nothing about that car that would prevent me from getting in it and driving it across the country right now. It's fine. So the Aston Martin is, is really cool. It doesn't get driven that much but it is very cool. But the last owner did the belt service himself. <laughs> no thanks. So I just bought my first Ferrari. Um, and I realize how pretentious it says it, it sounds to say my first Ferrari. It presumes more Ferraris. <laughs> I hope I live long enough to buy more Ferraris. My period of enthusiasm is well defined, late '80s, and so the Ferrari 328 was always something that I found incredibly appealing. I liked it better than the 308 because it had more power. I prefer the front end treatment on the 328. It was just, it was of that late 80s period. To me, the early 80s period, the cars, yes, are a little simpler, a little like leaner, and there's period people who like that, but for me, it's the late 80s is really what, that age of excess is really uh, where I, I live. The 328 GTS is a Targa roof, mid-engine, transverse uh, engine car, 3.2 liter V8, and it's a lovely car, and especially so because I've got the Countach and the, and the 911 of the same period, it really slots in between those cars very nicely. It has elements of what I like about the Countach. It has elements of what I like about the 911 in terms of its usability, its lightweight, its ease of dealing with it. Uh, I've only had it for a couple weeks. It's new uh, to me. And so it's a uh, it's an '86, so that's pre ABS car. It has forty thousand miles on it. It came from right up the road. You may have even seen this car at car shows before. It was at Radwood Road Atlanta two years ago, and it's a really good car. I think it has done some sitting recently, like the Countach, and so it needs some miles put on it, which I'm working on right now. I've got about five hundred miles on it so far. I'm driving it every day that I'm home. It's my daily driver right now. 
In fact, the only thing bad about it is that my shop is like four and a half miles from my house and it's actually not far enough to warm the car up. So I have to drive like three exits past my house and then turn around and come back just to make sure the car gets all the way warm on the way to work. But it, it looks like it won't be comfortable to sit in, but it actually is. Gated shifters are every bit as satisfying as you think they'll be. It's nice to have two cars with that. And I like Testarossas a bunch. I've driven Testarossas, they're pretty cool. But the lightness and the agility of the 328 is not present in the Testarossa. And also, you don't have to take the engine out to do services. You can do your belt services and stuff with the engine in, and that means that your maintenance costs, if you really want to drive the car, which I do, the maintenance costs are really on par with an 80s 911 and not on par with an 80s Lamborghini. I intend to explore my miles are cheap philosophy with this car and just drive it any time I feel like driving it with utter disregard for the, for the mileage. I didn't necessarily want black, but I definitely didn't want red. And so I sent my car finder, Steve Serio, who knows, he knows where the bodies are buried. I said, I'm looking for a, a, a non-ABS 328 GTS in not red. What can you find? And he found a silver, he found a green, and he found the black. The green was very promising, but the last owner did the belt service himself. <laughs> no thanks. Maybe he was great, but I don't want to find out the hard way. So, so this one uh, had been serviced at a very reputable shop, had lots of records, and so uh, we went with that. I'm very excited. I mean, really, to have a Ferrari, a Porsche, and a Lamborghini of that period, it's a very, very satisfying to me. And the best thing I can do is drive that car as, as much as possible. And I, you know, I talked to a lot of collectors, a lot of people who have had many Ferraris, have said to me, you know, that's the one. That the 328 is the one. It's the easiest to live with. It's it it really gives you that classic Ferrari experience, but it's not so old and clunky that you can't just turn the key and use it whenever you want to do it. So so far, so good. You know, so far, so good. He had spent a truly shocking amount of money to not really drive it very much. When we were growing up, you were always either Team Testarossa or Team Countach. I was Team Countach. And when I was a kid in Atlanta, growing up in Atlanta, Formula One imports. Do you remember Formula One imports? It was in Buckhead and it was like the gray market Lambo Ferrari store in the 80s and my parents would take me there when I was a kid and a guy who owned that place, he was very impressed with my knowledge of all the cars. I could rattle off statistics and all that when I was like seven or eight. He'd let me sit in all the cars. I sat in the first Diablo to come to Atlanta, LM002s, Ferraris, but, but the one that, it was the white on white, the triple white Countach, that was the really the one. Um, I had the Alpine poster, you know, the whole thing. And so first time I ever really drove one was the car I ended up buying. A dude named Dave, he's a restaurateur in LA. He has a, a, a chain of local restaurants. There's five or six of them, he does well. He's a really cool collection. He buys great stuff, but he's really busy. He doesn't have a lot of time to drive it. And my car, he owned for 10 years. Uh, he was the third owner, I'm the fourth owner. The car was delivered new to, here's a name you'll know, Al Bertoni in Pennsylvania, I believe. I think that's where he was, somewhere on the East Coast. He's somewhere on the East Coast. And the car was Al Bertoni's car, and I have a prototype Bertoni exhaust on the car. They, he also added a Fuzz Buster, the Escort Fuzz Buster. It has the, the factory Alpine CD player, which was a $9,000 option in 1987. And it has remote door poppers. So it has overcharged door struts and actuators that are on a remote. So I can stand across the street and pop both doors. It's fire. I've never seen another Countach that can do it. I've, ne I've never seen another one. And I, I told uh, John Tamarian, I, I curated about it. He's like, I've never seen one that does that. So it's very cool. It came to California in the middle 90s. And the last owner before me, he only drove it about a thousand miles in 10 years. What he did do was rent it out for photo shoots. 
So I got a real Hollywood car. If you see a piece of pop culture that features a Countach in red from about the last 10 years, it's a, probably a 90% chance it's my car. And there's a couple key ways to tell. There's a, little, there's a little ding on the rear bumper you can see. The plate is visible in a few of them. There's, there's a couple little ways to tell which car is my car. But it's on two different photo shoots with Cindy Crawford. It's done a shoot with Diddy, uh, it was like the cover of GQ. It's in a Muse video. It's in the Ralph Lauren Red Cologne ad campaign. The only service it's had to get since I've, I've uh, got it, I rented it out to some DJ who paid to have it put on stage during his set at the Palladium. What an unbelievable waste of money this was. And they had to, it couldn't go indoors without, with fluids in it. So I drove it to GTO Engineering, who looks after the car. They drained all the fluids, flatbed it to the thing, pushed it on stage. I got a free service out of it. <laughs> so the only service it's ever needed. So he rented it out to, to a bunch of shoots, but what ends up happening is you smoke the clutch from being loaded on and off of trucks. So he called me and, and said he wanted to sell it. I made a deal. I will buy it at this price, but I want a, I want a perfectly deliver, you know, a, a perfectly functional car. That's the deal. If it breaks the next day, fine, but I, but I will be handed a perfectly functional car. So it, it actually was a great deal. I was able to buy the car fresh out of a major service with a brand new clutch. And I realized very quickly that, because I saw the service bills, that over the last 10 years, he had spent a truly shocking amount of money to not really drive it very much. I mean, I, I, I wanna say it cost him $75,000 in service over 10 years to really not drive the car so much. Now, before he sold it, I reviewed it. He let me, he was a buddy. He goes, do you wanna drive my car? Yes. <laughs> and so I spent a day with it. He flatbedded it to the canyons and I up and down and up and down and up and down the mountain and it was one of the best driving days I've ever had. And so when the opportunity came to buy it, I was able to put the money together and I, and I bought it. But I, I saw how much the dude spent to not drive it. And I just said, well, how could it possibly cost any more to drive it? I mean, if, if it costs you this much money to, to stare at the thing in your garage, well, how bad could driving it be? And so I started driving it and I started making a point to drive it. I have a thing called Lamborghini Exercise Day in which I put at least 50 miles on the car. So I've had it about two years and I've put 7,400 kilometers on it, which for a Countach in modern times is quite a lot. It's a lot of driving. And you know what? It works fabulously. It's a real runner. It loves to be driven hard. Uh, like all Countaches, it's a little clunky when it's cold, all the Italian stuff is. But when it's warm, and it takes a while to get warm because there's like 12 quarts of oil or something in the dry sump. I mean, it takes forever to warm it up. But when it's warm, I mean, there's there's almost nothing that's that, that is satisfying, you know, on that kind of level of, of purity. You know, it's, it's 3,200 pounds, double wishbone suspension, built in a time when Nürburgring lap times didn't matter. What matters? How fast to go in a straight line? How comfortable is it to drive on the highway? And can it get around a corner? Kinda. And so it's really, really, really good. I drove it to the SVJ press launch. I was a, that was a move. That's a flex to roll up at the SVJ press launch in a Countach. It's like, oh, park this up front, please. Driving it is fabulous. Looking at it in the garage is fabulous. I've rented it for a couple of photo shoots, although I drive it there myself. <laughs> I, mind, I mind it myself. What's really great about a car like that is every time I take it out of the garage, somebody comes up to me and says, I've never seen one before. And, and that is, is very, very rewarding. And it kind of reminds me, A, that I'm a little spoiled because not only have I, do I have one to look at all the time, but I've, I've seen a bunch. You know, not that, it, not that if I saw one on the street, I wouldn't do a double take, but, but you know, I, I've seen them. And there's people who have never seen them. And to see the reaction of someone seeing one just out on the street, you know, for the first time, is, it's, a, it's a really special moment. They, they really, you watch them take it in. It's very cool. It's so much different from a modern supercar, which it just seems, they seem so much more mass produced. And they are. You know, they made 2,000 Countaches from 74 to 90. Mine is one of 617 
uh, QVs, four valve cars, and only, and less than 200 of those were injected. Mine's an injected car, so there's a carburetor versus injected. The carb guys, there's a couple people on Instagram that are like real snooty about their carbs. Real snooty. And they literally will jump into the comments on my Instagram to remind me that, that the carbed cars have more power. <laughs> Just so you know, your car, your car makes less power than my carbed car. Oh, thanks. When, you, when I show up at English Town to drag race you, we'll note that. <laughs> so the funny thing about, you know, right now is like kind of peak 80s is going on, right? So the Countaches are very hot for photo shoot bookings and stuff like that. And <laughs> what's funny is when you, when you buy a car like that and you start posting it on Instagram, the casting people find you and the booking people find you. They want to use your car in, in whatever it is that they're doing. Now, they always start by offering nothing. <laughs> it's his hot new director. <laughs> you, you have to see it. He would love to work with you. Yeah, I'm sure he would. But more likely what happens is, I know a lot of the Countach owners in LA and, and, and they try and lowball us. They, they play us against each other. They go, I want to rent your car. And I go, here's how much it is. And they'll call over there and they'll go, Can you do, will you do it for less? And they lowball you down to this. So I didn't want to play that game. And so I held firm at a very high price for, uh, for a, a, a shoot that demanded a red Countach. They wouldn't, no other color would work, only red. There's three reds in LA. Leno, the head of O'Gara, and me. Okay, Leno's not, he doesn't need your money. He's not doing it. Head of O'Gara, doesn't seem likely. But I held out and I got big dollars for it. And so I started the Countach Union. And the acronym is Countach Union Negotiating Top Salaries, which, uh, yeah, spells uh, My wife made a nice little plaque for me and everything. So now, if an agent wants to rent a Countach for a photo shoot in LA, they go through me. And I have fixed the price. So that way, we don't get taken advantage of by these sleazy agents that are trying to lowball us. Find another car. If you want a Countach, you can call the union and we will provide one in any color you like. And it's the exact same price, no matter which one it is. I decided the guaranteed ticket was to make a pass in the shoulder. I don't recommend doing this, ever. Um, the first to get a ticket challenge video is, in hindsight, one of the most shocking examples of white privilege I have ever participated in. And I talked, I don't know what order people will watch this video compared to other videos, but I talk about my privilege a lot, especially recently, as I'm trying to be um, a better person. and especially as we, we know what happens when certain cross sections of the population run into contact with the police, you could, you could end up with, with a deadly scenario. And the idea that myself and Rob Ferretti at 25 years old in $400,000 cars would f with the police intentionally. I mean, I, I, I can't think of anything more privileged than that. And in hindsight, it just, it's crazy. And it was Rob's idea, because those types of ideas definitely are Rob's ideas. And it was what it sounds like. He said, we're gonna have a contest and we are gonna see who will get a ticket first. We're gonna go out and intentionally find cops and do something in front of them that will get them to pull us over. You know, what's interesting about that, most people haven't actually seen the full video. Most people have seen the YouTube version which is like three or four minutes. The full version is from one of Rob's DVDs. It's like 25 minutes, the whole, the whole thing. There's a lot more to it than was just in the YouTube version of it, but I actually don't really remember because I haven't watched it in so long, I don't know. In the YouTube version, okay, here's, I think this is how it went. So he went out in his Corvette, which was like a turbo C5 Corvette with a giant wing on it, very obnoxious. And I went out in a Mercedes SLR McLaren and I chose that car specifically because I hated it. I, I, I think it's one of the worst supercars ever made. 
I, I just, I can't, they drive awful. For the amount of money it costs to buy one, they are proper junk. And I wanted to make a video where I really on a supercar and that was the one I hated the most at that time. So me and Rob left the Gotham warehouse in New Jersey. We went on the New Jersey Turnpike and I saw a police officer and I decided the guaranteed ticket was to make a pass in the shoulder. So I, I, did a se I passed a semi in the shoulder, which you gotta understand. <laughs> At the time, this was like peak bull run road rally baggery. I don't, I don't, I don't endorse this. I don't do anything like this anymore. If you drive on the street with me, I'm, I'm a very, very calm driver unless I'm doing the one thing that I do up in the mountains completely by myself and at five o'clock in the morning. I passed a semi in the shoulder. Obviously I was pulled over. The cop, you know, came up asked for my license, you know, he's looking at the, the documents and, and Rob did like a Top Gun style Maverick flyby while I was on the side of the road. And he did a flyby, I mean, it, you know, top of fourth gear, it was deep into the triple digits. And it was so offensive that the cop literally threw my license back at me, ran in his car and chased him. And actually, he pulled him over and I went and found another cop and I did the same thing in front of a different cop and got a ticket, a reckless, in front of the different cop. I don't know why I thought that, the ticket was real. And the tick, the, I got a real reckless driving ticket for a video that I did not get paid for. I didn't make any money on it, and nothing. It's just like a thing I did. And that cop that left me and chased after Rob, he got, the, he got a reckless from that guy. So we both got recklesses. I don't even remember who won. I don't remember who got the first, I think he got the first one and I got the second one. But a couple things that really stand out about that story are that one, the cop that left me and chased Rob was identified later and was fired because of that video. The tickets were real. And for me, it was something that it cost me, I mean, it cost me thousands of dollars. It was a real ticket. There were real insurance issues. And, you know, that period of 2008, nine, peak road rally douchebaggery. You know, there's people who would do those events. They're so rich, they didn't care. I mean, insurance premium goes up, whatever. You know, they got 50 Gs in cash in the glove box for bail. You know, th that level of not caring about what you're doing on the road. That, that really wasn't me. I never had that kind of money. I never had that level of not caring. It never occurred to me that tickets just didn't matter. I was not in that financial bracket or, or have that type of attitude. And so the, the moral of that story is everybody involved got in a lot of trouble. Me, Rob, and the cop got in, all got in trouble. The cop got fired, I think, I don't remember why it was he got fired, exactly the exact reason, but he did get fired. It, you shouldn't do that. I mean, really, you really shouldn't do that. And and it was 2009, I was a different person. I mean, you can see my sideburns, that's how you know. The side, the big pointy sideburns, that's that's a different person. And yeah, in hindsight, it's it's kind of cringeworthy to me because the the privilege is, is so on display. In a, it, it really takes a certain level of not understanding the world to go, I'm gonna go out in a $400,000 car and f with the police intentionally. It's just, it, it, I'm glad it's entertaining. I'm glad it was an inflection point in my career making videos. I'm, I'm glad that people still find it kind of funny and silly, but I also, I think there were a lot of real lessons in that, in that video. And, and I'm glad that I'm not that person anymore that would do that. And I, I think that it's not about showing respect for the police. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about not understanding the relationship of the police to society and why it's very tense, you know. It was, it was right when I started making YouTube videos and Rob was still selling DVDs. The YouTube clips would promote the DVDs and he'd done like, a bunch of DVDs. I mean, five or six different DVDs he'd done. And every one of them was just, just crazy driving on the street and running from the cops and all this kind of stuff. And it was Rob's idea. I mean, it was a very simple idea. He just said, hey man, you wanna do this? And I was like, 
Oof, that sounds sketchy. But he was like, nah, I'll be fine. Whatever. It's kind of, I, I know all the cops here. It's okay. <laughs> At the time, I, I mean, I, I, I believe I lost. I believe that Rob, having taken my cop, was able to get the first ticket. And I think I felt really stupid for going out and getting another ticket once I had already lost. <laughs> I, think, I think I was like, why'd I do that? That was so dumb. We did, I mean, we did other stuff that was more lighthearted and fun than that. That was gnarly. I'm glad it's still out there. I don't want that video to ever come down, but I, I'm, I'm re, I, I, I know I'm, I'm beating a dead horse, but I'm really glad that I'm not that person now. Having been through it, right? Cause it wasn't just that video. That video was one thing, but I also went on the Bull Run Rally three or four years in a row. And on one of those events, I believe it was 10, 2010, I got seven tickets in one week all across the country. And I had to do a second road trip in reverse to fight them all. And I, I actually beat most of them. But doing stuff like that when I was younger, it was penny smart and dollar foolish. You really don't think about stuff like, like, like how this is gonna affect your insurance for the next 10 years, you know? Where you are an established reckless driver in the state of California and now you have to, to deal with the consequences of that. And I think that, um, <laughs> I wish I had, I wish I'd thought that through a little better. <laughs>they'd see the cops, they'd make noise, they'd radio, and if they took one for the team, they got the 500. Me and Larry Casilla of Ammo, we went to high school together, and after college, we started this business together that was the detailing shop in New York. It was called New York Motor Club. Larry, then and now, is the detailing master. And I kind of ran the branding, right? I, I got people in the door, I kept them entertained, and I, I ran what at the time was sort of an early version of social media for the shop and the website and stuff like that. The detailing shop was called New York Motor Club. There wasn't really a club, uh, but we made a club. And what was so interesting about this club is Larry and I owned the shop, we were like 25, and we started a driving club. The people who were our customers, they would just drive back and forth to the car wash, get their, their Ferrari washed, have a cigar, and that would be it. We were like, this is dumb. You gotta drive your cars. So this was in like 05, very early days of Google Maps. And I got good early at finding routes that like people had just never found, like right in our own backyard practically. Here's all these roads that like, these are here? What do you, how did you even find this? I guess the motorcycle guys would dig through maps back in the day, but but the car folks really didn't, or at least not in my presence. So I made these crazy routes in, in Google Maps and we would go out really early in the morning and go for drives, you know, as you do, right? With the club, what was crazy was a couple things. One, that we were like basically kids running the club and the club was full of adults, 30s, 40s, and 50 year old guys, sometimes in their 60s and they took it really seriously. Not like, we're gonna get together and go for a drive. Like, they had board meetings, they voted people in or out. I mean, it was, it, they took it seriously. You had to be in the club to get the sticker on your car. I was almost like, you guys are taking this really seriously. This is kind of weird, you know what I mean? Like, they wouldn't let people in if their car wasn't nice enough or if whatever, we had, you know, interviews. It was silly, it was really silly, but, and that was, that was outside the cars. That was like in the upstairs of this Italian Goombas restaurant in Harrison, New York, where we used to meet. It was like a mafia thing, it was crazy. But what we would do with the drives, I told you about how I started making videos by, by videoing these drives. And that's how I hired my first cameraman, because he was the only guy who was crazy enough to hang out of my Corvette at like 150 miles an hour. We didn't have suction cups. It was handheld, it was all handheld. That was all, there was, mounts weren't a thing. But the videos of the drives wasn't the craziest part. You know, we wanted to go real fast, right? And we didn't want to get in trouble. And so what I would do is I would hire these high school kids who had like modified Hondas. And I'd have them drive ahead of us real fast and loud, make all the noise to draw the heat. 
and I had a deal. If you were pulled over on the side of the road by the cops and we drove by, you got $500. And I had to pay it out once. <laughs> I did. I had to pay the 500 once. But they'd radio, you know, they'd see the cops, they'd make noise, they'd radio. And if they took one for the team, they got the 500. And we would go out and just, I mean, it was like 150 to 170 miles an hour up the 684 freeway in New York at early in the morning. Adults acting like children, you know, and <laughs> I'd have like a catered lunch for them at the end. But the real story is that I hired kids in Hondas to be <laughs> to distract the police from what we were doing and that it worked. <laughs> so the cars that were in the club, this was 2006. So there was a lot, the Z06, Lots of Z06s. They were very popular. C6, Z06, very popular. The M6 and M5s, the V10 cars. Everybody had those. They all had the Eisenman and the Meister shaft exhaust. It was like the, the piercing. That was the first car I ever did 200 miles an hour in. It was a, a stick shift M6 convertible. Porsche 997 turbos. Those were very popular. There was a couple of Lamborghinis. I believe there was a, a Gallardo or two and a Mercy or two. There was a, a guy with a Diablo. This dude, there should pro probably be a whole story on this dude. His name was Dave Vitali. And if you look this guy up, he claimed to be some kind of security expert, like Blackwater, right? But he's yoked. He's got no neck. And he would drive around in a black H1 Hummer and a yellow Diablo Roadster with a tribal graphic on it. Like imagine you took the SV lettering, but instead of that, that placement, that size, but rip the bro tattoo off and pfft, tribal. And he had this dude develop a wet fogger nitrous system for this thing that actually, I mean, it was very stupid. All he did was purge the stuff out. But if you open the hood and looked, I mean, it was an extraordinary piece of rigging that went down this, Lamborghini's manifold. It, it, it was real. And <laughs> this guy, he was the, he was like uh, on the Maury Povich show. He would like help set up stings to catch people cheating. This guy wouldn't blend anywhere. <laughs> There's nowhere you could put this dude except Gold's Gym where he would blend. And so the idea that this yoked meathead and his yellow Lamborghini were somehow gonna set up a sting <laughs> catch somebody. I mean, it was ridiculous. But the, there's still some pictures. I don't know what happened to the guy when I moved to New York, to LA, and the, the guy was gone. But, but you know, that, that guy was, he was in the club and he was ridiculous. Uh, Rob Ferretti was a member of the New York Motor Club. And actually, you know what? You know, Mike Musto from Hemmings? Musto, Mike Musto was member number three. He was our third member at the club with the 68 Dodge Charger, the Mr. Angry Charger. There was a couple pro touring cars as well. I, I mean, it wasn't like Veyrons or anything like that. It was a local club in Harrison, you know, Westchester, New York, uh, north of New York City. And it was, you know, mostly young professionals, some blue collar, some white collar. And they took it serious, serious. Not just the driving, the organization. There was a ton of car one-upping. You know, the dude, the dude, guys, he had a Carrera 4S. One guy gets a turbo. The next week, they all have turbos. You know, it was, it was, there was a lot of keeping up with the Joneses and it drove business. It drove business, but I learned a valuable lesson from it, which is that marketing a local business to a global audience is a lot harder than you think. Even really before like Bull Run and Gumball made it to us, you know, these, these, they didn't have a lot of these kind of single day driving events back then. And it's a very common thing now. You see, it's all the time. You know, whatever little club goes on a little drive and it's, it's normal. But back then, there really wasn't much to do with the cars. And so we had, uh, we had these events. And then we needed a shop car. Well, we got to have a shop car to lead the drives. Well, we had a limited budget. We had like 50 Gs to work with for a shop car, which was not, not nothing. But so we, so we went, bought, this is the most 25-year-old choice ever. <laughs> We were like, we'll get a Cobra, a Superformance Cobra. And there's no shortage of those. So we start looking around and we realize a regular 427 Cobra, eh, people have seen that. It's a special Cobra. 
So there was a guy, and you're a cannonballer and a one-lapper, so you probably know the name Dennis Olthoff. So in, I believe, 2001 or two, he entered a Cobra in the one lap, and he won. And I bought that car. And that car was a death trap. That car had a ex-Bill Elliott NASCAR engine in it that uh, it had an MSD rev limiter in it. We put the rev limiter at six, so we didn't die. It made 410 at the tires at six. You could put a nine chip in it and it would get there on race. You'd have to put, so you'd have to put C16 in it, but we put it on a dyno and it was 600 at the tires in 2005 in a 2140 pound Cobra. <laughs> and the transmission was a four speed Jericho crash box. It had no power brakes. The doors were welded shut. It had a five gallon fuel cell in it. No speedometer, no odometer, no fuel gauge. Yeah, okay. It had a tack, it had a tack. It didn't even have a key. It had tabs, battery tabs. This was a race car. And the license plate I got for it was make you poo which was spelled make up OO, which is make you poo. And this was probably the sketchiest car. Even if I had the skill that I have now, which is average, I like it's still, I would still be like, Rrr. back then I had no skill. And it, this thing was, it couldn't have been any sketchier. I mean, I think I drove it. You had, you had to stop every 40 miles or so and put gas in it. <laughs> it's ridiculous. And I think I drove it maybe 10 times before I sold it. We sold it to somebody and you know what? Now it lives at Spring Mountain in Nevada. It was repainted black. Uh, when we had it, it was Nissan 350Z gold, which is actually a fabulous color. It looked cool as hell. Black wheels, black Halibrands, black pipes, black roll bar, gold. It was bitching. It was good. Now it's all black and it's literally some guy's like track toy at Spring Mountain. But that was definitely uh, the most childish car purchase that I have ever made. The show is designed around eight cars, not four, and like some stories about cars breaking. I'm doing a show called Sorted, which is testing out a bunch of different modified cars. And this has its roots all the way back to like when I was a kid, almost turn of the century, and you had this thing called the Super Tuner Challenge. I think it was like car and driver, road and track would do these like comparisons between like Hennessy and Lingenfelter and Mallet and all these guys would come out with their modified cars and just go have at it. And you just like look at the statistics column and be like, holy crap, that guy just did zero to 60 in 3.5 seconds, which now is nothing. But back in the day, 20 years ago, that was like, can you believe this? Look how fast this car went. Now, fast forward 20 years, nobody's doing stuff like that anymore. And I was like, how do we get these guys together? And I started a, a series to try this out on my YouTube channel. And it was just a bunch of YouTubers coming together and it was called the Project Car Challenge. And I've learned over the years, the first Project Car Challenge we did was in Las Vegas. It was Matt Farah, myself, David Patterson, uh, Tommy Effie and Rob Dom. And we came out and we brought these cars out and we were gonna do a half mile challenge and then a hot lap challenge at a racetrack. And Rob's car had some issues, uh, which cars do, modified cars have issues. And he was stuck all night, so we couldn't go out and do our, let's just say the, the, the area of, of Las Vegas that I had shut down for this is quieter at night than it is during the day. So we decided we'll do that after the racetrack. And that's when I learned that you can't do the hard stuff first because the cars aren't gonna make it. My car caught fire, good times, because that's what it was supposed to do. For YouTube, that's excellent. If you're gonna catch fire, you wanna catch fire at a racetrack because you had a guy right over there with a fire extinguisher right quick. And then after that, started the car up, drove it away. So that's good. That was uh, the fire. It was more dramatic than it should have been, but it was the, the protective heat shielding that caught fire, 
which means it's getting pretty hot up in there. But the car put down some great laps. It was very fast. It just didn't go the distance. And I then sent it down to Texas to get modified, to get dialed in. And now I'm going to try to compare that to other cars again. But before that, I was like, you know what? Let's just do this with other people's cars. And that's where Sorted came in, that we were going to take this thing we were going to compare the cars and progressively make it harder as we went along. So we're not going to like go out and go gung ho and start doing hot laps and everybody breaks. Next thing you know, we don't really have a competition because everybody's broken. And little did I know that held fairly true in, in some of the filming here that some of the cars, it's like, all right, all you got to do is show up. And that was a problem. Now we had over 190 people uh, submit their cars to be used in the show. We selected eight for the East Coast, eight for the West Coast. The goal is to then race them against each other, the two winners. So we're racing the two fastest cars to see who's got the fastest car in the country effectively. Obviously the sample size is limited, but we still get to shake it out and we're running a lot of fast cars. In Florida, the average horsepower was about a thousand wheel horsepower per car. So that's pretty impressive. That, that's it. That's attracting the right the right group of cars. So you're getting these guys to properly modify. Lots of money goes in. When you start getting into the, the thousand horsepower range, you're not eBay parting that car. That car is ideally uh, has a lot of money invested, whether it's sorted or not. That's why we're here to find out, but it does have a ton of money put into that car. And it generally driving on the highway and doing these highway pulls makes these guys feel like they're a little bit more invincible than ultimately they end up being. So now here I am and it's two days prior to the filming of the first episode of the first show and I start getting phone calls. Hey, uh, bad news. What? Uh, my car uh, is, is uh, the one guy with a, he had a turbo R8, single turbo R8, which you don't see very often, mostly twin turbos. He had a great red single turbo R8, getting it back from the tuner, going to pick it up. It's all good. Oh my God, I need new tires. I got to source new tires, got new tires, started driving. He's like, nope, nope can't come. That sucks that the guy went through all this effort, got it tuned, got it all sorted out, and ultimately the car wasn't even driving well. He's like, I can't, it's, it's undrivable. So that one went back. There was like three or four inside of 48 hours, which I'm like, what is going on right now? Like half of our field that was handpicked isn't ready. There was another guy who uh, had an R32 Skyline, great car, 1,000 horsepower, and he decided to be more competitive that he was gonna just switch it over to sequential. Let me tell you, there is no just switching anything over to sequential. It's never like drop in and then just start her up and go drive down the road. And that was a problem. And he's like, well, just give me till Friday. Friday came and went, not going to be done. I'm like, I know it's not going to be done. When you told me you were switching it to sequential seven days prior to this thing filming, even though you're already in Florida, I knew that wasn't going to happen. Another guy, Honda S2000, Turbo S2000, great looking car, blue one up in New York. I think it was making like seven or 800 wheel horsepower and he just got the car back and he wasn't making any boost. So I was like, all right, well, you're like, you need to make boost. Otherwise it doesn't make any sense. Finally got it making boost. And I'm like, okay, good. Whew. Then he got nervous because he, the car was just down for like two or three years and he just had the new engine put in that he was afraid to break it again. And that's probably super telling as far as that struggle people have modifying cars. Cause sometimes after a certain point, you just get so tired of it breaking that you just lose all interest in it. And that defeats the purpose of this whole thing. Why modify something to the point where you don't want to drive it or you're afraid to drive it. This is a situation where he just put a brand new motor in it. The thing should be good for a while. And he was afraid to drive it because he, if it broke again, he'd be so like, let down that he can't drive this thing for maybe another two or three years because it does get expensive. I'm not going to spend other people's money. I get that everybody, and, and I've been in that boat where you pour virtually every paycheck you come in. It's like, all right, food, car payment, everything else is going into the next part that I can afford. And the engine is not a cheap part. So he was out. Luckily, I had the yellow S2000 that stepped in that was local in Florida which was a very, very well dialed in car. Um, I, was, I was really excited to see that one show up. And it was like sort of swap for swap. It was like 800 horsepower S2000 for 700 horsepower S2000. Worked out very well. Then of all things, guy with a Mustang coming out of Staten Island, my tow vehicle broke. Uh, ultimately, I ended up giving him my truck. I'm like, just here, you take my truck, just get it down. I can't lose another vehicle. I'm, I'm having enough trouble now that these people are bailing legitimately the last minute. The show is designed around eight cars, not 
four and like some stories about cars breaking. Same thing happened when you fast forward to California. So I ultimately got all eight cars down to Florida, not the original ones, but we had like last minute, we had the, the Viper, which was awesome. There was a, a Calvo Viper that came down, the Sissio Porsche, and the S2000. Those were all last minute additions and they filled in the three cars and they were all within 48 hours. Oh, and then the RS3 which was another terrific car. He called me up and he was like, love the idea, I wanna be a part of it. And I'm like, all right, cool. Can you make it to Florida? Where are you coming from? He's like, oh, I'm in uh, Minnesota. I'm like, oh dude, we're filming in Florida. Like Minnesota, you're like, you're not even close. He's like, no, no, it's 28 hours away. You guys aren't starting for 37 hours. And I'm like, see you there. And I like that. I like that like gung-ho these guys and they had a gorgeous trailer too that, that that rat hana was the guy's name he goes by rat which is like an interesting name to give yourself but uh he brought down this 930 wheel or all wheel horsepower it's like 1100 engine horsepower audi rs3 and smooth side trailer which is the option nobody pays for because it's expensive but it looks really nice but this guy obviously put money into everything brought down that car last minute I had people coming from all over the place, but like one kid drove down from Buffalo for a show called that's called Sorted. Most cars are either like local or, or coming in on a trailer. This guy got in his car. It was a turbo swapped IS300 with a one Jay-Z. Legitimately got in his car, drove it straight to Florida. Drove like 23 hours and I was like, you sir, that car, like whether I like it or not, I'm not, nobody's gonna argue that that car is not sorted. And it was good to see them all come out. Here we are in California, what happens? Same thing. Car drops off, car drops off. This car's coming. The, the one guy who was gonna come to Florida, but he's like, you know what, I'll just go to the California one. He was in Texas. He was bringing a ZR1. It was an 09 ZR1, 1,000 wheel horsepower. Sure enough, like a couple of days before, oh, we're changing the oil, there's shavings in the oil. You're out. And I guess at that point in time, you're tearing the thing down anyway, but you don't want it to fail on camera. But there was other cars that, that just showed up or didn't show up at all. Like I had uh, two Porsches. One of them, uh, to be fair, pulled the COVID card, which you can't argue with. Uh, somebody in my shop is sick, so I'm not going to come. But I had two like really cool Porsche turbos coming out to California. We ended up with none. So we ended up having seven cars. I did get a replacement for the one Porsche is when the Sheepy Race Audi, the twin turbo R8 came out. I just can't even remember. I can't even keep track of how many cars we lose because these cars were dropping like flies. There was a Datsun too I lost. It was a very cool 1970 240Z and it was like full blown race car, full ground effects, a giant wing. Like this car, I, I looked at it and it was like, all right, this guy has put a lot of money into dialing this in. This is effectively like a SEMA like booth car and that car failed too. But it's amazing for a show that's called sorted, trying to find out how well built these cars are, that our, our fail rate prior to even filming was at like 50%. Now imagine what happens when you film with cars that actually show up. I'm telling you, not all of them made it. Now what's great about this show is that usually like when, when I make my stuff, I'm funding everything. Here we had the first sponsor to step up. I've had this idea on the table for years since I did that initial project car challenge. But Autotempest reached out and as with Car Trek, they're funding and putting together, like they're doing God's work right now. They're allowing YouTubers to go out, be creative and make these shows. And, and you go and watch Netflix and everything like that. And it's like, oh, cool, fastest car. I can't get into that. As a car person, you can't get into commercialized stuff. Like it's, it's just impossible. But Autotempest decided to step up and they were the first money in for both me and car track and they make these shows possible which is really cool i mean that's if you don't know auto tempest which if you're watching this channel and you don't i don't know what to tell you go click on the link in the description but they have all the it's an aggregator so they bring all these different search sites together so when you're looking you don't have to be like where else am i going to look for cars you can just look on one place and it aggregates and pulls together all these listings to make your searching much simpler and save you a ton of time It's like a $300,000 car that nobody seems to want. Every time I see Chris Harris, and I'm not trying to celebrity name drop because he's on Top Gear now, we did the drive together. 
uh, we were on the, the Drive Network. Chris Harris had a show called Chris Harris on Cars, and, and I had a show called Tuned. Whenever I get to see him, it's always a good time. We end up at the pub, usually very drunk. And inevitably, three or four drinks in, he always makes me tell this story to whoever is around, even if they've heard it before. We talk about Emil Rensing. And Emil Rensing is the person who was an early partner in a company called Next New Networks, which was a YouTube multi-channel network in 2007 and 8. And unlike today's multi-channel networks, it was all in a building. So the channel creators and the management and the ad salespeople would all come in and do these things in this one place. He lured me away from the car wash that I had with Larry. I sold it. And I liked making videos for him. This is the kind of thing that would never happen again. He paid me a salary to make YouTube videos. That doesn't happen, won't happen again ever. Hasn't happened since. But in 2007, that was a, that was a possibility, right? He kind of lured me away from the car wash with promises of stock options, health insurance, you know, all the kind of stuff that a Silicon Valley guy would promise talent that they want to bring in. It didn't last. None of the promises that he made me were kept. I ended up about a year later, the company after the crash in 08 sold to Google for very cheap and I didn't get anything. I wanted to keep making videos. So my cameraman and, and me, uh, Tom Morningstar, we moved to California. And, and actually California was where this guy Emil lived. At the time I was upset about losing that job but I was, and, and I did kind of blame him for it, but he was still throwing me little gigs here and there. And so I kept a friendly relationship, even though I didn't really like him that much. He was in the middle of, of a divorce. We're now in, we're now into 2009. I have moved to California. I just, I just got to California. Okay. I'm in a little beach house in Hermosa beach and Emil is in the middle of a divorce. Okay. And he's going to be moving back to New York. All right, I'm leaving LA, I'm going back to New York. All right, I gotta go, but there's a, but he had a Scuderia, a Ferrari Scuderia, like yours, downstairs. So he had this Ferrari Scuderia, and he goes, I gotta go to New York. There's a truck coming next week for the Scud. Would you go to the office and pick it up, bring it to your house, put it in your garage, drive it around a little bit if you like, and then next week a truck will come for it. Okay, fine. This was, the Scud was new, the idea of driving a hot car back then mattered to me a lot more than it did now. I go get the car, I cruise it a little bit, bring it to my house, I park it. A week goes by, no call, no text. Two weeks go by, no call, no text. Three weeks go by, no call, no text. Now I'm annoyed. Now I don't care that there's this new hot Ferrari. Ferrari. I I've driven it around a couple times. I don't wanna drive it anymore. Now it's just taking up space. So I'm calling Emil. He's not picking up. I'm texting Emil. He's not picking up. Days go by, he doesn't get back to me. This car is just sitting in my garage. It's like a $300,000 car that nobody seems to want. <laughs> it's, it's just there. No one's coming for it. No one's calling. No one's planning. Eventually, I get tired of this bullshit, and I called his ex-wife. Not out of, malice, out of malice. I called his ex-wife, Carrie. I said, Carrie, look, I'm sorry to bother you. Emil told me to grab the Scud and hang on to it until this truck shows up. Truck hasn't shown up. He's not picking up. She goes, you say you picked up the Scud? I said, yeah, I picked up the Scud. It's in my house, in my garage. She goes, what color is it? I go, Carrie, what are you talking about? It's black. You know it's black. She goes, mother f He bought two. And she didn't know about the black one. She knew about the white one that was in Long Island. And guess what she got in the divorce? The black one. <laughs> and, and I blew it up because Emil didn't answer his God phone or warn me that he was trying to scam this car out of his wife. You ask your friend to stash a car so your wife doesn't find out about it and then you vanish? <laughs> leave the car? You don't let me in on the plan? Once the wife found out, a truck showed up very quickly to get the car. And I, I swear to you, 
I had a working relationship with that dude for about four years after that. He never brought it up once. And I never brought it up once. He knew that he fucked up. I knew that he fucked up and that I blew it up. And what was he gonna do? Be like, why'd you call my wife? Why'd you leave an abandoned car at my house? He never once brought it up ever again. After that first company sold cheap and I got kind of bounced to the curb, I was mad, but when Emil made the drive network happen, because it was, it was JF's idea, and then, I mean, Emil was basically a professional middleman. All he ever did was connect A to B and get a piece. That's, that was his whole thing. So he connected the drive network to the YouTube executives, carved off a nice piece for himself. I was pissed when I got booted in 08. I had crawled my own way back to a certain point to a little bit of money and a little bit of fame for the smoking tire by like 2011. And when the premium content initiative came in, it was like, wow, well, Emil has, has brought a deal. You know what I mean? He's brought a budget. He's brought, we can go out and make some produced content, which I really liked. And so at that time, no, I, I wasn't mad anymore. And then, I, and then uh, now I'm, I'm forever mad. I'll not, this, uh, this will not be let go ever. He sank the drive network and he ended up going to prison. Not for that. He had an, another job. The drive network thing, he was a partner in, but it wasn't his job. He was the head of digital media buying for the Epics movie channel, which was a Viacom property. And his job would be to buy ads on digital media, advertising Epics and movies on Epics. So he created a bunch of fake digital marketing agencies. But in doing so, he used real names of people that he had worked with in the past on the paperwork. He used the drive network addresses for two of the fake companies. So he didn't go to prison for stealing from us. He, go, he went to prison when Viacom caught him having stolen $7 million. And he went to prison actually not for the theft. He went to prison because he used real people's names, which made it identity theft. And so it was like 30 counts of identity theft and he got like four years in prison. Uh, I think he just got out, because this was, yeah, this was, about, this was about 2016, so he would have just got out. Everyone likes to hear some shied and fraud, you know, happens when, you know, a bad person gets it. You know, you want to hear that. And so every single time I see Chris Harris, it's once a year, three or four pints in, Matt, 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 come here, Matt, come here. Tell, tell him, tell him about the Scuderia. Come on, come on, tell, tell him, tell him about the Scuderia. And every time, I, he f rolls on the floor laughing every time I tell about the time I blew up his hidden sc the scuderia he tried to hide from his wife. <laughs>We go, okay, we're gonna do a 60 to 150. And they're like, well, it would really be better in a 100 to 200 race. It already takes a certain type of person to, have a, to buy a Viper. It then takes another type of person to modify that Viper. Imagine the type of person it takes to build a business modifying those Vipers, right? Imagine that personality. The Calvo Motorsports Viper <laughs> is really the rolling reflection of Antonio Calvo's personality. The guy is extremely extroverted, loud, funny, flashy, and it's all about more, 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 more. It's the most Texas car ever, right? Every time you go to Texas, it's always the same thing, right? Thousand horsepower, stock brakes. <laughs> That's the most, it's the most Texas that it gets, right? He's got sli slicks on the back, stock wheels on the front, Four-figure horsepower stock brakes. That's that's a Texas build, right? Fortunately, these guys started with an ACR. So uh, downforce, brakes, you know, the fastest car Chrysler's ever made. So you're starting with that. They then built the motor. Starts as an 8.4 liter. They stroke it to 9 liters. And they add twin 76 millimeter turbochargers. So depending on what map and what fuel and what day... You know, you're talking about anywhere from 1,100 at the wheels to 2,000 horsepower at the wheels, which is an absolutely unfathomable uh, uh, number. I mean, you tell someone something has 2,000 horsepower and they go, I, I don't even comprehend that. What, what, is that, what does that even mean? You, it's got 2,000 horsepower and a license plate? 
It's got 2,000 horsepower and you and you just drove it here? Like, what do you what do you mean? It, for, for these guys, there will never be enough things to brag about. It's always about being the fastest, the craziest, refusing to really believe. And then anytime something else got close, there was always kind of an excuse. You know what I mean? Oh, well, if we were running four less PSI on the tires. Oh, well, we were running map three. If it was map six and, um, yeah. Oh, well, it's, uh, it's uh, the ambient temperature is the 92. And, you know, meanwhile, okay. Having said that, holy mother of God. <laughs> they weren't wrong. <laughs> they, they may have had some dodgy excuses, but they weren't wrong. And the car was bananas. And the numbers that they were taught, oh, it does a, it does a 240 standing half mile. It do, you know what I mean? It's like, it, not, the lap times at Circuit of the Americas are like, you know, Le Mans cars, <laughs> you know, like whatever. I've never in my life been in any thing that pushed on my chest with the force of that Viper in fourth gear. The Viper, we're talking about a rear wheel drive car that does 100 to 150 in 2.83 seconds. It, it recorded uh, yesterday the, the fastest 60 to 150 I've ever personally seen. It did a 5.05. 5.05, 60 to 150. And to do that in the Viper, you start in second. So it doesn't hook up until fourth. 5.05, 60 to 150, but 2.8 of that is 100 to 150. So you spin them for three seconds till you get to 100, put it in fourth, and floor it, and the needle goes <laughs> and, you're at, and you're at 100. I, I've never in my life felt anything like that. Now, Sissio pulled out a data log from his phone. He's got some GTR runway car that does it in four, four something, four seven or four five. But it's, 20, it's 2,200 horsepower, so whatever. You're talking about rear wheel drive, nine liters, twin snails, and a sequential box with downforce, 1,200 pounds of downforce at 150 miles an hour. The front end lifts because the wing is so gnarly. And it just doesn't grip at all. It's, it's, it's got a very advanced motorsport-based traction control system. So it will keep accelerating, but it'll be like, -da 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 -da, you know, it'll be, but it'll go. But then just fourth, I've never felt anything like it, ever. The force on your chest is proportional to the throttle. So as, you, it's just, you know what I mean? Like it, it's, it's an un, it's, I've never felt anything like it. The force was so heavy and the straightaway disappeared so fast. I mean, it, you came out of the corner, wound out third kinda, put it in fourth, went, and you're at the end of the straightaway. In the 60 to 160, they had to turn the boost down. What happens with cars like this is they, they can't hook up. First, second, third gear, they don't hook up. So they, they want to do roll races from 100 miles an hour. <laughs> that's, that's what they want. We go, okay, we're going to do a 60 to 150. And they're like, well, it would really be better in a 100 to 200 race. Well, well would it? What a practical build you have there. How many people are going to get to find you to roll race you starting from 100? <laughs> like, what is the point of this thing exactly? They'll talk about tracks like they're at them. They're not. They're on the 130, two o'clock in the morning. I, go look them up on YouTube. Look up Calvo Motorsports Viper on YouTube. How many videos are you gonna see from tracks and how many videos are you gonna see from highways? If that's what you can get for writing a $250,000 check, not that that isn't a lot of money, it is. But that is an, it is a, a, an experience unavailable at any price from anywhere else. And that's, that's what you're buying. But when I got to Florida and I saw it there and I was like, I'm gonna get to have a go in that. The problem it had in the East Coast Regional, they brought it out and it had triple fuel pumps. And they told us, if, if the thing gets to a quarter tank, get out, stay out of the boost because it will slosh the fuel rearward in the tank and the pickups are in the front and you'll, you'll run and drive. I guess we got kind of close to that during the street drives because one of the fuel pumps of the three took a poo. Uh, we felt bad. We thought we did it. It turns out, I think it was on its way out anyway. So what they did in between was update it to a new single better fuel pump. It didn't improve the fuel economy, but you didn't have to worry about running it dry anymore. 
which in that car is a real problem. I mean, that car is, again, I have never seen a four-wheeled vehicle go through fuel like that, ever. And the fact that it's E85 made it worse. You know, E85 is, I hate E85. E85 is like, it's such a nightmare. No one ever has enough. <laughs> <laughs> you go through you go through it four times as fast as you go through gasoline and nobody ever brings enough. A pull a gallon. A pull a gallon. You wind out third and fourth gear, it's a gallon of gas. That was the other thing about sorted. We made up these games. You know, you you just make up games. And you have no idea, you know what I mean? It's not like it's not like we made up the games based on the capabilities of the cars. We made up the games based on what we wanted to see them do. And to us 10 laps of a racetrack is not that big of a deal, but a, a lot of the cars we had out there, uh, Tanner referred to as one pull wonders. You know, you, you it, it made all the power for the one pull and either it just got heat soaked or it, it did, you know, it did something else that it and, it, and a lot of the cars couldn't really make it more than two or three flying laps, which is a problem <laughs> for sports cars. Now, I, it should be said that the cars that made it to the final, for the most part, could, even with enormous horsepower. <laughs>